there we go. I think we're live now. I think we're. I think I pushed the right buttons on uh, on the uh, the settings. I accidentally unplugged the the things. I had the microphone earlier. So yep, it looks like it's going good. Yeah, it is going good. Okay. Yeah, happy Easter to uh, everybody, and uh, appreciate you guys being here. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I'm gonna have to figure out what in the world. Hmm. Spreaker just stopped playing. I, I don't know. I don't know what in the world is going on today with uh, the technology. It's just one of those things. So let me fix this real quick. This is what happens when you are the tech person. You are the, uh, you know, the host and everything else. So you just gotta go with it. Go with it. So let me fix this real quick and find out why this is acting crazy. Um, okay. Yeah, it's, it, it really is. It's all, it really is something. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's really interesting. It's fascinating how it's not doing it. Hmm. Yeah, happy Easter, everybody. Happy Easter. Well, I might I might not be able to have this on podcast, but because the speaker is acting. Well, that, now it's working. Now it's working. See, I unplugged it, and uh, that's, why, that's why I did that. So let me fix this real quick, and so the people can watch it or, or listen to it later, and then we can kind of go from there. So in the meantime, let's talk to Miss Wilma while I'm typing all this. Hello, Miss Wilma. Happy Shikong and happy Easter to everyone out there. Well, you as well, and hopefully you had lots and lots and lots of chocolate. Yes, I did. So, very, very pleasant. Yeah, I had a rabbit today. You had a rabbit. So Miss Wilma had her uh, had her Easter. Hopefully, all of you guys had a great Easter and. Um, uh, I think that's wonderful. I think that a lot of people, you know, and let me just say this. I, I'm so, I'm so tired. I am so tired of every single time there is a Christian holiday and there's a, people are always saying how Christians, uh, are, it's a pagan holiday that folks, I'm, I'm so, I'm so sick of that. I really am. It, that is so incorrect and it's stupid. And people do this to, to purposely try to make uh, Jesus re reduces divinity. They do it during his birthday. Uh, they're doing it now during the resurrection, during Easter, and they're constantly doing this. And this really is, it, it, to me, it, it's kind of, um, it's upsetting. It really. So, Miss Wilma, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, and we're going to get into the, into the Bible study in just a second, okay? Okay, I'm going to go back and move. All right, sounds good. All right, let me just give you a little bit of history uh, lesson, because uh, people say Easter is a Catholic holiday, and the church should uh, only celebrate Passover. Well, no, folks, again, the name Passover comes from the Hebrew word Pascha, uh, and this meal was shared with Jesus and his disciples before his betrayal was the Passover Jesus would have been celebrating as a Jewish man. So most earthly Christians were Jewish, and therefore they naturally continue to celebrate Passover, but tended to integrate the celebration of Jesus' resurrection into the holiday. This is much of what we see in the Messianic that the Jews will do today. However, a controversy arose in the first century, uh, which was, uh, it, this was in the first one, 300 years after Jesus' ascension into heaven. So many Gentiles began to join the church, and there became a divide between those who celebrate the Messianic Passover with the Jewish traditions and those who observe the resurrection without the Jewish traditions. So the Passover Jewish tradition consisted of a three-day feast, or, or I'm sorry, fast, uh, before the Passover meal and a vigil night before the celebration and a feast. And these traditions actually carried over to the observation of Jesus' resurrection, which the Christians celebrated, as we now know, Easter holiday. So the controversy didn't stop there. Two, two, 200 years after the first century, there was a division in the, uh, in, of the idea of Easter itself. And the controversy uh, ha it had to do with the date that Easter was celebrated. So Christians at that time were celebrating Easter according to the Jewish Passover date, which is the 14th of Nisan, which is the month of April in the Jewish calendar. However, other Christians were celebrating Easter a week later, and it was decided by the Nicaea Council that the Easter date would be determined by the first Sunday uh, after the Pascha full moon, after the spring equinox. So the Easter celebration changed over the years, and it developed into a 50-day event, which had a longer fasting period to commemorate Christ's time in the wilderness and to mourn his crucifixion. And that eventually became Lent, which developed into a holiday in the Middle Ages, where the emphasis was no longer on his resurrection, but more so on his death and in the mourning surrounding, surrounding that period. So Lent is a Catholic practice where 
we use Easter as a method to evangelize and, and um, the, for new converts by training them with Christian teachings and doctrines, etc. So Easter was hugely recognized for baptisms. And then time continued on in the Catholic Church art added even Mardi Gras, which is French for Fat Tuesday. And that is when you would use up all the meat and dairy products before fasting during Lent. And then Ash Wednesday would launch you into Lent where you would fast. So the reformers, however, removed these two days of celebrating uh, Easter and kept the Holy Week days, which were Marty Thursday, which was when Jesus started his walk into the, to the crucifixion for Good Friday. And of course, that's so Good Friday is when, when Jesus was crucified. And then Resurrection Sun, Sunday, was G, that's when Jesus was resurrected. So while some Christians do celebrate Passover, Easter, uh, it is distinctly Christian holiday, has been since for the first century. So enough, enough. Now, now let's talk about Easter, uh, Easter eggs and bunnies. Because they say, and this is really important, because I'm so sick and tired of people going on social media spreading this crap. It really is just, it really irritates me because they're constantly doing it all the time during Christmas and Easter. They do it all the time. And they even said that the Jesus story was stolen from Horus, uh, the, the Egyptian mythology. So I actually went online and I destroyed that argument line by line by line. So they don't really talk a whole lot about that much more anymore. But now they're, now they're going after Easter. So that's what they're doing now. So they're saying the Easter eggs and bunnies are taken from a pagan fertility festival. Let me tell you something about that, folks. Again, everything they can do to, re, to, to destroy the credibility of Christ, everything they can do, everything. So here's the truth about Easter eggs and bunnies and why we have them on Easter. So where do they come from? Well, actually, if you know much about Lent, Lent had to do a lot with that. So in medieval times, Lent and fast were very strict. So when you fast from food, that was very strict. You would abstain from all meat and dairy products, including eggs, but eggs would be boiled to preserve them longer, and you would eat the eggs to break your fast. So painting eggs came later on as a way to celebrate Easter. You would, you would see this in Ukraine. So Easter eggs are a symbol of new life to represent the resurrection, being born again out of the old and coming into the new, breaking free from the shell because of Christ's resurrection. So, so what about the Easter buddies? They say, eh, that came from this, uh, this God, this uh, pagan God. No, it's wrong, sunshine. You see, very early, actually, on, very early on, uh, in the, the Virgin Mary was associated with the hare, with the rabbit, which was often mistaken for a rabbit. And you can actually you can see this uh, in early Christian paintings by the artist uh, uh, Titian. Whenever there was a painting of Mary, he would paint a white rabbit uh, beside her. And this was because the association between the rabbit's fertility and, and purity uh, and Mary. Rabbits are used in pagan holidays and other religious symbols of fertility. So the same as the celebration of esoteric in an Anglo-Saxon culture which we'll, we can talk about that later, but it should not come as a surprise when Christian symbolism is copied or twisted in other traditions. So since rabbits were an additional symbol of Easter's meaning and not a core value, their presence surrounding Easter does not make the holiday pagan. It just means that the Christians took rabbits to reflect a certain principle that is inherent in Easter, just like the pagans took them to represent their own principle. It, it's fascinating how, to me, people say, well, the pagans did it, so therefore the Christians copied. No, they did not. The Christians did not copy. The, the pagans took the, the rabbit and, and chose to use the rabbit for whatever, whatever reason that they did. The Christians did the same. So it, it's fascinating to me how it's always this belief that the Christians stole from the pagan faith, which is stupid. The idea that the Easter bunny was a distinctly pagan is actually, let me tell you where that came from. That was popularized in the 18th century by Jacob Grimm. There is no, there's actually no evidence of the statement that he made other than just his own speculation. So this is where all this came from. Jacob Grimm in 18th century. Eggs symbolize resurrection, were fasted during Lent. White rabbits are affiliated with the Virgin Mary. Uh, and, and of course, they also say that uh, Easter is a pagan holiday named after the goddess um, Esoter or Esoter, wrong again, another myth. 
Uh, some believe that, uh, that, that, this, that this is a, named after a goddess. Folks, here's the truth. That's not true. And we've learned so far, Easter has all, all along been a holiday rooted in Christian tradition, scripture, and the stories of the gospel that's connected to the Passover in many ways. So where do the accusation come from? Well, it has to actually to do with the word Easter. Thank you. Uh, itself, because the word Easter is connected with the name Esoter or Esotere, a goddess in the Anglo-Saxon pantheons. The first mention of this was by the Venerable Bede, who was a monk uh, in the uh, Anglo-Saxon area in AD 725, mentioning that the indigenous English name is the month uh, Esotera Monath, which is now translated as Paschal Month. It was named after the goddess Esoter. Therefore, People have concluded that because Easter as a holiday was associated with the month in that name, that it means that Easter is a pagan holiday. It is not. So it was a misinterpretation. The, the only places where Easter has been named rooted in the goddess Esoter are countries that have been affected by the Anglo-Saxon pantheon, such as Britain and Germany. But if you, were, if you were to go anywhere else in the world, particularly countries in Europe, the name Easter as a holiday goes, goes back to the uh, actual, the original word, which is Pascha taken from Hebrew. So again, I, and I can go on, I could do a dissertation on this. I could, I could give you a 10, 10 hour presentation just on this alone. But I think it's important to discuss this because I'm, I've just grown tired of constantly seeing this online. I'm not surprised, I'm not surprised at all. Uh, but it is, um, it's one of those things, again, people try to discredit Christianity and they've been doing it for millennia, and they're going to continue to do it, even after, but they'll continue to do it. We know they'll continue to do it. Uh, but hopefully now you have, you have, oh, I could, but I have, you may have uh, 10 hours, but other people, this is people's, this is people's church. So we're having Bible study. So we're going to get into our Bible study today, but believe me, uh, if someone said, do it, I have 10 hours. That's funny. Um, oh, I, I'm, maybe one day we'll do a 10 hour presentation on this. Just drives me crazy. No, just it truly drives me nuts. So anyway, that's the truth of it. And uh, I'm sure the hater gators out there are going, oh no, no. Like, okay, whatever. Uh, all right. Yeah, Bible study. Let's get into it. Folks, for those of you uh, who have uh, on TikTok, as you know, uh, I'm going to uh, to put sub sub chat only on for the first hour. We do that because of the trolls. And I apologize, I have to do it. Uh, but the trolls come in and you know what, this is Easter. We're just not, I'm not gonna put up with it. So I don't put up with the nonsense. Uh, so sub chat only, I'll, I'll turn it back on to everybody. Thank you, I'll turn it back on to everybody uh, when uh, at around nine o'clock or so. All right, our first reading is Acts chapter 10, verse 34 verses 37 through 43. Yeah, I think this was, that was very important for me to mention uh, it, it because I have, you know, I have to mention this because I'm seeing this all over and it just bothers me. So Acts chapter 10, well, thank you very much. And for those of you who know, have no idea who I'm thinking, um, the folks there on TikTok are often gifts to the ministry. I'm saying thank you for that. So thank you. All right, Acts chapter 10, verse 34 and 37 through 43. All right, let's get into this. It says, Then Peter proceeded to speak and said, You know what has, just, was, what has happened all over Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went out about doing good and healing all those oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. This man God raised on the third day and granted that he be visible, not to all the people, but to us, the witnesses chosen by God in advance, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commissioned us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. And if we were mass, we'd say the word of the Lord. Okay, let's talk about this uh, because we have a, let me give you a little bit of a background on this, as you know. Oh, you're very welcome, Becky. Yeah, I agree. 
So assuming that uh, Jesus' crucifixion occurred around maybe AD 30, AD 33, Saul was actually converted, we believe, in AD 33 to AD 35 or so, and came to Jerusalem uh, from his preaching in Damascus around AD 36. Now, if the Acts of the Apostles is arranged in chronological order, today's event occurs after Paul's meeting with Peter in Jerusalem. And what we hear of today is the inauguration of the mission to the Gentiles. See, Cornelius was a Roman centurion of the Italian regiment, and he had a vision. And in this vision, an angel had told him to send to Jaffa and summon a man named Simon, who was called Peter. And about noon the following day, Peter also had a vision in which he saw heaven opened, and all kinds of animals, which he is told to kill and eat. Now, Peter, surely, he says, surely not, Lord. I've never eaten anything uh, impure or unclean. So we can assume that animals were considered by the Jews to be ritually unclean and therefore forbidden. So the voice in Peter's vision says, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This vision occurs three times and leaves Peter wondering what it means when Cornelius' emissaries arrive. And Peter accompanies the emissaries back to Cornelius. And once Cornelius recounts his vision, Peter realizes the meaning of his own vision, saying, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. And Cornelius has been expecting Peter and has called together uh, as relatives and close friends. And there's a, quite, a, quite a crowd that's gathered here. So 34 said, then Peter proceed, uh, proceeded to speak and said, you know. Now, Peter presumes that these Gentiles have heard the message of Christ, a message that, will, that he'll, he's going to repeat at his teaching. Now, some commentaries presuppose that the people do not know this story. And the comment, you know, actually contained in verse 36 is addressed to the Christian reader of the Acts. It's a presupp presupposition, which is unwarranted, in my opinion, really. Uh, ver chap verse 37 says, what has happened all over Judea. So Judea is controlled by the Romans, and all the goings on there are familiar uh, to the centurion. What has happened all over Judea, beginning in Galilee, uh, after the baptism that John preached, God, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Okay. He went about doing good and healing all those oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. So all the way from Galilee to Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on the tree. Uh, if this is a figurative expression for crucifixion, by the way. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23, remember we talked about that during Holy Week, says that anyone who is hanged on a tree is cursed by God. And Jesus bore the curse of the covenant for us because we were unable to offer the perfect sacrifice, which would atone for the sins of the people. This man God raised on the third day. Now remember, the number three in Hebrew numerology is the number of completion. So the, the world was formed in the first three days of creation and filled in the second three days of the same creation event in Genesis 1. So Isaac was restored to life, resurrected, in the eyes of Abraham on the third day when God stopped the sacrifice and substituted a ram instead. So on the third day, and granted that he be visible, not to all the people, but to us, the witnesses chosen by God in advance, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. It's a, so this is a true resurrection. And, and Because remember, uh, the, I talk about this a lot. When, when the disciples saw the resurrected Christ, they were terrified and they thought it was a ghost. And Jesus says, don't be silly. I'm not a ghost. You know, ghosts don't have flesh and, buds, uh, flesh and bones that you see that I have. And he asked for something to drink and eat. So this is a true resurrection of body, total resurrection. So he says he commissioned us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one appointed by God. So up until this time, the actions of the apostles have been restricted to the Jews, and now Peter is addressing Gentiles for the first time. So that he is appointed, uh, he is the one appointed by God as the judge of the living and the dead. Now, folks, the only being, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of people, again, going out spreading misinformation, saying the Bible never says Jesus is God. That is such, that is such a lie. That is such a lie. Peter is making this abundantly clear. 
because the only source, the only being that can judge the living and the dead is God. That's what Peter is saying. And Peter is saying that Jesus judges the living and the dead. So what does that mean? If the, It's in logic. It's basic logic. The first premise, only God can judge the living and the dead. Jesus judges the living and the dead. So that's your second premise. Therefore, the conclusion must be Jesus is God. There's, <laughs> there's no other way to look at this. I mean, that's logic 101. I mean, that's elementary logic. It's elementary as you can get. So that's the problem. A lot of people are saying, well, the disciples never said that. He's saying it now. Uh, chapter 43, to him, all the, all the prophets, to him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him, in him, in Jesus. So remember, belief is more than acceptance. It's a total commitment. It's not a concept. We'll receive forgiveness of sins through his name, whose name? Jesus' name, because why? That is the name is the authority. Again, you have Peter. So you have, it's a very clear, very clear, without question, that the disciples were making it, they completely understood that Jesus is God, because the only being that had the authority to forgive sins is God. And, and now we're saying that the individual who now forgives sins is done through his name, through Christ's name. So Jesus was given full authority. God gave Christ that full authority because he is the second person of the Trinity. So the, 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 remember, the ambassador speaks in the name of the one whom he represents. So remember the old po the police shows where they would uh, say, stop in the name of the law. The policeman was invoking the authority which he represented. The same thing goes for Christ. And the only way that you can do that is when you are in one with that, especially with God. So you, you can't, you certainly, uh, you, can, you can't remove God from the equation here. So Jesus made it abundantly clear, as well as the disciples, he is God. He is the second person of the Trinity. God comes to us in three persons. And I don't understand why people find it so complicated. I, I don't understand. God can do anything. He exists outside of our understanding. But think of this for a moment, just, just for a moment. And here, let me explain it to you as, um, perhaps maybe as, let me explain it to you this way. Many people come to know God in different ways. We come to know each other, even us, you and me. You come to know me as Bishop James Long. Other people come to know me as just James, as their friend uh, or, or brother or sister or, or, or uncle or whatever it might be. Can't be sister, but uh, it's the same thing with God. Our relationship with God develops in many different ways. We have a relationship with God as our Father. We have a relationship with God as through our Savior. We have a relationship with God as through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is how we can come to know in our limited ability, God. You see, there's only one way that you can get to know me, Bishop James Law, because I'm not God. But we have a God that is so powerful that he gives us three different opportunities to develop a relationship with him. Do you understand? This is the Trinity. So we have the understanding and the relationship with God as the Father. We have the relationship with God as our Savior. And we have the relationship with God as the Holy Spirit. Folks, that's it. That is, that's it. And I think when we understand it from that perspective, then it's like, oh, well, the Trinity is not that difficult. I mean, certainly I'm, I'm, not, I'm not simplifying it, but that's how I look at the Trinity. They're three distinct persons. 
So that, that's very important to understand. But that is how we get to see, that is how we get to have a relationship with God. Because God understands and he wants a relationship with us. And this is why he gives us three different opportunities to develop that relationship. I think it's very powerful. Very, very powerful. Okay, Miss Wilma, uh, how would you teach our kiddos the first reading? Hi, sweethearts, and happy Easter to you. As we celebrate Easter, Jesus rose on the third day. This is what Easter's all about. Yes, Jesus is alive and living in heaven. He's looking down, watching over all of us. Jesus taught his disciples to go and preach, telling everyone all about him. Jesus does not have any favorite ones. No matter who you are, Jesus loves all of us. Jesus does, Jesus does want all of us to follow him, loving him. Jesus wants all of us to be part of his family. All who believe in him and love him and obey all his commandments will get to live in heaven with him. There's nothing to be scared of in heaven, darling. You never, ever get sick anymore, taking yucky medicine. Yeah. No more being in pain. Everyone loves everybody, even the animals. We will get to play with all of them. I, yay, I get to play with my bears. Woohoo! Oh, I love my bears. We get to play with the elephants. We can even ride them if we want to. Lions, the wolves, all of the animals. Heaven is a beautiful, beautiful place. We all are there. He's going, we're all going to have a big celebration, having a big feast. That's a meal with Jesus and all of our loved ones. Well, there you go, Miss Wilma. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Just as long as the feast has a low salt, right? What? As long as it has low salt, low sodium. The, the meal has to be low sodium. I don't have to worry about low sodium. Oh, I don't have to worry about oh man. Oh, then the, we're going to say put the real butter in that stuff. Don't put that fake butter stuff. Put the real butter oh, in there. We're going to have all the celebration meal. All we can eat in these. Yeah. Don't have to worry about sodium or anything. Well, let's get going. I mean, and I get to play and have my bears. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to those bears first. I'm gonna talk to them and say, listen, just scare her. Just go burr. Just we'll just, just just please just do me a little favor. Just come on. Might get in trouble. In heaven, you can't they won't they won't do that. The every animal's gonna love us back. You just have this all figured out, don't you? You're just taking the you're taking the fun out of it. I ain't taking the fun out of it. It's just that we're gonna get to play with my bears and we can even ride the elephants and tigers and Oh my stars, all the wild animals won't be wild in there. Uh huh. Okay, well, we'll have a big celebration, and we we'll all get to hear Donnie Austin sing in the front row since he's a famous singer. You know, I I'll be sitting, I'll be sitting there playing with my baby and listening to Johnny. Oh, wow. I thought you said this was heaven. It's going to be heaven. It's going to be beautiful. Oh, oh, I'm looking at it. I'm looking at I'm looking at a picture of Jesus right now saying, please, please, please. I beg you, please. Oh, my goodness. This would be a oh, boy. All right. Are you ready for a second reading, Miss Wilma? Yeah, you go on moot, and so does Donnie Osmond go on moot. Okay. No, 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 no. Daddy <laughs> I'm telling you, folks. I'm telling you. We were talking, and I'm sorry for those of you who were, we were just having who were having a great conversation about heaven. And I, I, I apologize if you got kind of thrown off there, like I did. Uh, but it's all going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I, I'm confident that if that is the case, 
and we have to sit at a Donny Osmond concert. I'm confident that God will give us a, the best blindfold in the world and we'll have earplugs that you won't even be able to hear crickets do, making the noises. No, 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 no earplugs. No, no, no earplugs. No, no, no earplugs. <laughs> I thought you were going on mute. I did go on mute. I had to come back. Will you put just will you please go eat your chocolate bunny? <laughs> <laughs> I will right, be right. We'll be with you in a minute. Well, a lot, a big uh, fourteen earplugs. Okay, all right. Uh, Colossians, everybody. Ch Colossians chapter three, verses one through four. Colossians chapter three, verses one through four. Yeah, we got we. Uh, you know what? See, honestly, I believe Jesus had a real great uh, sense of humor. I do believe that. Uh, I I think Jesus loved to laugh, and I, I think he I think he had a great sense of humor, and that's that's so important. I think we forgot to do that in this world. I really do. I think we've forgotten to laugh, to just enjoy, because there's we are so inundated with so much stress. We are we really are. All of us are. Most of us have a lot so much stress going on that we forget. We just forget. It's okay to laugh. It's okay. And, um, you know, to, to, to enjoy the small things. Really. That's right. Uh, someone said, I'd much rather be on the front row for an Elvis. Amen. Who is that? Who said that? Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. Who, who said that? Facebook. Facebook user doesn't put me, put, put, put your name on there. Was that uh, Father Bill? Whoever said, I'd rather be on a uh, front row for an Elvis concert. Yeah, we'll have to find out who that is, who wrote that. Okay, uh, second reading. Oh, Father Bill Payne. Oh, Father Bill, we're going to have to canonize you. All right. Uh, <laughs> and, put, and, and put Sean in timeout because I'm sure he's not agreeing. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. Okay, let's go, everybody. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. If then you were raised with Christ, seek what is above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Think of what is above, not of what is on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, your life, appears, then you too will appear with him in glory. And if we were mass, we'd say the word of the Lord. All right, happy Easter to you. Uh, happy Easter, everybody. Let me explain this one before we get into the uh, the heart and the meat and potatoes of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for the likes. We have 71,000 likes. Thank you very much. The more likes we have uh, on TikTok, it gets it puts it in the algorithm so people can join us. So yeah, keep liking it, and I certainly appreciate that. Uh, this reading, it's a practical application of the teaching given in the early chapters of Colossians, so designed to suit the circumstances that have arisen in the Colossian church. Remember, the early church had some problems of understanding the doctrine. And we, and we understand because it was new. So by his death and resurrection, the Son of God frees us from the power of Satan and of death. There's a lot of people now going around saying that Jesus didn't have to die. Now, I'm very, very, very concerned with that type of theology. Jesus made it abundantly clear multiple times that he was here to lay his life down. He knew before he before he was even handed over, before the threat of before even Gethsemane, he knew that he that his mission was to lay his life down for us. In the very beginning, he knew this. So the idea to say that Jesus didn't have to die, folks, that theology is very dangerous. That it's very dangerous because I, I've explained the theology of the cross and why the crucifixion was necessary. So the, the idea that, that Jesus did not have to die is, I'm sorry, I disagree, I firmly disagree with that completely. Completely disagree with that. Jesus taught that many times to his disciples. Uh, I, I'm very concerned about that teaching. So let me remember by baptism, uh, Vatican II said, by baptism, human beings are, are grafted into the Paschal mystery of Christ. They die with him and rise with him. So in other words, Christians have been raised to a new life, a supernatural life, whereby they share, even while on earth, in the glorious life of the risen Christ. You know, this life is at present uh, spiritual and hidden. 
But when our Lord comes again in glory, it will become manifest and glorious. There, there are two practical consequences flow from this teaching. The need to seek the things that are above, that is, the things of God, and the need to, think, uh, to, the need to pass unnoticed in one's everyday work and ordinary life, yet to do everything with a supernatural purpose in mind. This means that those who try to seek holiness by imitating Jesus in his hidden life will be people full of hope. They will be optimistic and happy people. And after their death, they will share in the glory of God. And they will hear Jesus' praise. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful. And I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So let me break this down for you. Yeah, yeah I agree, Brian. Uh, it is super dangerous uh, because he knew what he had to do. And uh, even, like I said, even before uh, the, the Gethsemane, he knew. So the idea that Jesus didn't know that he had to die, that he had to accept the crucifix, that ultimately destroy sin and death, to enter, to allow us to enter into a new covenant, boy, that is a dangerous theology people are teaching. And, and there's a lot of people teaching that now. And that I believe that is, uh, that is that, that's, uh, I think that is in error. So it says there, if then you were raised with Christ, seek what is above. So this contrasts things that are above and things that are on earth, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. That's By the way, that's taken from Psalms 110, verse 1. And that, that shows his lordship uh, and complete victory. Think of what is above, not of what is on earth, for you have died. So in baptism, we have died to sin. We are raised in Christ. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. So the Christian is no longer attached to the material things in this life, but to the spiritual things of, of life in Christ. And there are preachers, there are Christian preachers who are now preaching that baptism is no longer even necessary. Folks, I, 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 this is scary. This is frightening to me. When you have preachers preaching that baptism is, you don't even need to be baptized. That's, that's, that's all right. It's kind of like, a, it's like a, a little ritual that really doesn't mean anything is what people are teaching. That, that, is, that, that to me is an abomination. I'm sorry, that's wrong. Jesus made it clear that we are, that we are to be baptized in the, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus even, even told his disciples to do this. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, this, this theology that people are teaching these days is quite scary. It's, it's quite scary. And some people may consider me conservative, and that's fine. That if you wish to, to label conservative, I don't consider, uh, I'm not labeling myself either conservative or liberal or moderate. I, I label myself as what did Christ teach? And that's what I'm going to follow. I'm not going to interpret or throw my interpretation in there. No, because Jesus made it very clear. This is what they're supposed to do. So if it wasn't important, he would not have commissioned his disciples to go and baptize using the Trinitarian formula. So the idea that we don't have to be baptized is not really important, then why would Jesus commission his disciples to do this? See, that's what I'm saying. It drives me crazy. It is necessary. And sacramental theology is where people need, I think pastors need more training. Uh, right, right. Uh, so it says here, when Christ, your life appears, then you too will appear with him in glory. So although St. Paul's main emphasis throughout has been on the present resurrection with Christ in baptism, this is a reference to the future resurrection and at the end of time. And I'm going to remind everybody uh, that I, we'll, we'll be talking about Revelation on the top of the hour, and uh, we'll discuss that uh, in just a second. So, Miss Wilma, if you're going to teach our kiddos, uh, how would you teach our kiddos this uh, small reading? Hi, sweethearts. And Sean, honey, you are not drowned, okay? <laughs> That's by being easy. Uh -huh. did, did you ever make a mess? Well, I sure do. Sometimes when I'm eating a hamburger, mustard gets on my blouse. But that's okay. I mean, we all have accents. And we all make messes, don't we? Then it makes a stain. But when it's washed out, it's all clear. Yay, my blouse is all clean again. Sometimes in our life, some people make mistakes and mess up. 
when they do something wrong. No matter what anyone does wrong, when they ask Jesus to forgive them, Jesus will take away like that stain and remove that sin and wipe it clean and forget all about it. That sin's gone. Never will come back. Jesus gets hurt because some people forget about him. Yep, that's right. He does get hurt because he loves all of us so much. Jesus is in heaven above the beautiful blue skies watching over all of us all the time. And our guardian angel is always with us too, loving us all the time like Jesus does. Thank you very much, Miss Wilma. You're welcome. All right. So let's get into our gospel reading and um, go from there. All right. There. So uh, our gospel reading is, sorry, someone's asking questions. Um, John chapter 20, verse 1 through 9. Okay. John chapter 20, verse 1 through 9. Okay. Yeah, and, and people ask a lot about the uh, the best app. There's, there are a lot of apps out there that are really good. Uh, of course, I've talked many times about the Blue Letter Bible app. Now, that's a great little app, and it's free. So, yep, there we go. So, John chapter 20, verse 1 through 9. Uh, on the first day of the week, a Mary of Magdala came to the tomb early in the morning, and while it was still dark, and saw the stone removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, they have taken the Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple went out and came to the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and arrived at the tomb first. He bent down and saw the burial cloths there, but did not go in. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and saw the burial cloths there and the cloth that had been covered, that had covered his head, not with the burial cloths, but rolled up in a separate place. But then the other disciple also went in, the one who had arrived at the tomb first. And he saw and believed, for they did not yet understand the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. And if we at Mass, we'd say the gospel of the Lord. This is a powerful, powerful reading, obviously. Um, none of the evangelists described the actual resurrection itself, for it was, it was, it was witnessed by nobody. The Gospels of the first Corinthians uh, witnessed the fact of the resurrection, however, by the testimony of the empty tomb and the appearances of the risen Christ to his disciples. It is fitting that on Easter morning, we should hear an account of what happened on the first Easter morning as Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Here's, what's, I, I, here's what I really find absolutely, really, really fascinating. There are a lot of people that will try to deny the resurrection. Well, that's just idiotic. Uh, these people were terrified of obviously seeing Jesus whipped, I mean, horribly. And we, we talked about that on Good Friday and what that would have, what that would have looked like. And there's no way. There, people say that Jesus survived the crucifixion. Folks, honest to God, if you believe that, you have your tinfoil hat is so tight on your head, you can't move it. That is the most idiotic, preposterous thing that anybody could say, truly, honestly. There was no way Jesus was going to ever survive the crucifixion there was no way uh, especially with the flogging that happened the crown of thorns he was dead they pierced his side he was dead so the idea that people are saying well he, you know they they stole his body uh, uh, really honestly you, you can't i can't even have a conversation with people that like that seriously because i i don't even know how to even go to that level on an intellectual level i just i that to me is the gutter of the gutter to me that just Unbelievably idiotic. And not only that, but keep in mind, Pilate made it very clear by putting guards there because he had heard. Uh, and then, of course, the, the Pharisees were very concerned that someone would steal the body and then claim that he resurrected. So that's why, uh, you know, Pilate made sure by putting some soldiers there that wasn't going to happen. Right, so th this whole idea that someone either stole the body or that uh, somehow Jesus uh, was survived the resurrection. Honest to God, anybody who says that you just you just say, okay, you know what? God love you, boy. I tell you what, I 
I don't, okay. Um, the soldiers would not have allowed anybody, anybody. They were given strict orders. Uh, so that there's no way that would have happened. And number two, even if someone did steal the body of Christ, he was dead. This, the, the, the spear to his heart, that alone would have killed him. And you couldn't even survive that now in the 21st century, let alone in Jesus' time. Come on. So Jesus clearly died, and nobody stole his body. There was a resurrection. It was so, I mean, it was so overpowering to the point where when the disciples saw this risen Christ, they knew full well what that meant if they went out and started testifying that Jesus rose from the dead. They knew that they were signing their death. They, they knew they were signing their death ticket. They knew that, that their death warrant had been signed, sealed, and delivered. Once they went out and said Jesus was resurrected, they knew full well what was going to happen, but they still did it. And so something happened to them that was so miraculous that these men that were terrified all of a sudden, three days later, come out and start saying, yeah, I absolutely saw, folks, something happened. Something happened that was miraculous. Now, we know, obviously, that's resurrection. So let me break this down for you, okay? Uh, on the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala came to the tomb early in the morning, and while it was still dark and saw the stone removed from the tomb. So all the gospel accounts are in substantial agreement concerning the time when the tomb was first found to be empty. It was before dawn on Sunday morning. And Mary Magdalene is, is also named by Matthew and Mark along with companions. And Luke gives no names but speaks of women in the plural. So in this verse, John seems to make it appear that Mary Magdalene was alone. But this is not necessarily the case, as we're going to see in the next verse. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 16, verse 7 says, re it relates uh, that the women were told to announce the resurrection to Peter and other disciples. John is the only evangelist to single out the beloved disciple himself. Continues, and told them they have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So obviously, this is why I say Mary Magdalene was not alone. The fact that, uh, that she says we don't know, obviously make it appear that there was other people with her. Uh, verse three, so Peter and the other disciple went out and came to the tomb and they both ran, but the other ran, the other disciple ran faster than Peter and arrived at the tomb first. He bent down and saw the burial cloths there, but did not go in. Now, <clears throat> there's no, re there's no reason is given for John's remaining outside the tomb, given the amazing distressing news that he and Peter had come to investigate. So it's assumed that by, by many theologians that he did not enter First, because Peter was the leader of the apostles, and as such, it was his responsibility to lead the investigation. Verse 6, when Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and saw the burial cloths there. So the Greek uh, uh, participle translated here seemed to indicate that the wrappings were flattened, deflated, as if they were emptied uh, when the body of, of Jesus uh, arose and disappeared, as if it had come out of the wrappings Without, their, without the wrappings being undone, passing right through them. And just as he later entered the upper room when the doors were shut, so one can readily understand how this would amaze a witness. So remember, the wrappings were still tied. They weren't untied. Uh, verse 7, And the cloth that had covered his head, uh, not with the burial cloths, but rolled up in a separate place. Okay, now this head cloth, by the way, this head cloth would have been tied, rolled like a triangular bandage under the chin and over the top of the head to secure the mouth in a closed position. The first point to note is that it was not with the other wrappings, but placed to one side. And the second, even more surprising, that is, unlike the clothes, it, it, it still has a certain volume, like a container possibly due to the stiffness given to it by the ointments. Uh, that's what the Greek, that is what the Greek participle here translated as rolled seems to indicate. And from these details concerning the empty tomb, one deduces that Jesus's body must have risen in a heavenly manner, that is in a way which transcend the laws of nature. So it was not only a matter of the body being reanimated as happened, for example, in the case of Lazarus, who had, the un, uh, had to be unbound before he could walk. 
pretty fascinating when you think about that, that Jesus, that the cloth that surrounded Jesus' body was still tied up. And then finally, then the other disciples also went and the one who had arrived at the tomb first and saw and believed, for they did not yet understand the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. Really powerful stuff, really powerful. Okay, Miss Wilma, let's teach our kiddos. How would you teach our kiddos this gospel reading? Okay, sweetheart. A Sunday morning before the sun came up, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. That's like a cave where they laid Jesus. Mary looked and said, the stone is rolled away. Mary ran where Peter and disciples was at, told them someone took Jesus away, and I don't know where they put him. The disciples ran to the tomb fast they could. John got there first. Then when Peter got there, Peter, stooping down, went inside. He saw the linen cloth lying there in the napkin. They had on Jesus' face. It was folded, lying by itself. The disciples knew Jesus folded them. They believed what Jesus taught them. Jesus was raised from the dead. My dear friends, Jesus Christ is alive, living in heaven. We celebrate Easter knowing Jesus died on the cross, and on the third day, Jesus rose from the grave. Jesus knew about everything, what was going to happen to him. Jesus did this for each one of us to save all of us from our sins. Jesus, looking down from heaven, watching over all of us all the time, he loves us very much. I want to give you Jesus' final message to, that he gave John. Jesus gave John a message for the seven churches. Some people have been faithful following Jesus. Some has turned away from Jesus because it was too hard to follow Jesus and just wanted things to be easy. But it's not hard to follow Jesus. Love him. Talk to him in prayer. The Ten Commandments are very easy to follow, but some wants to turn them around and live their own way, following and listening to the devil, which is wrong. Jesus' words are still very important. His words will never, ever change. Jesus said, I know what you're doing. It's neither hot or cold. I wish you choose. But Jesus is saying we can't believe in both. We only can believe in God or follow the devil. But he still wants us to, when he, because the devil is the one who wants us to do things. But we can't do both. In Revelation 3.16, Jesus said, here I am. I'm standing at your door knocking. And anyone here, here's my voice. Open the door. We'll share my food in my throne in heaven. Jesus is always wanting us to follow him and love him back. We want to open the door and let Jesus come into our hearts. Why? Because he does love it. And he don't want the devil to come into our hearts because the devil is the one who hates us and wants us to be in pain. Jesus is the one who loves us very much. Very good. Thank you, Miss Wilma. Thank you. And I hope everybody had a happy Easter and I hope everyone has a great night. And I love all of you and God bless. All right. We'll talk to you later. Okay. Night, right. everyone. Right, bye. Bye. All right, everybody, that was Miss Wilma teaching our little kiddos our Bible study. We appreciate her doing that. So thank you very much, Miss Wilma. Okay. Uh, I, there was a, there, there's conversations about the napkin, uh, about it being folded. There is a Jewish tradition of a folded napkin that's being linked uh, to uh, this particular gospel. Uh, but but a lot of people are debating this. This is one of the biggest reasons that the discussion began because of uh, of the Jewish tradition. 
see the, the what ha here, here's what here's this folded napkin or cloth relationship to the master of the servant it says when, when the servant set the dinner table for the master he made sure that it was exactly the way the master wanted it the table was furnished perfectly and the servant would wait just out of sight until the master had finished eating the servant would not dare touch the table until the master was finished now if the master was finished eating he would rise from the table wipe his fingers and mouth clean his beard and wad up the napkin and toss it onto the table the servant would then know to clear the table for in those days the wadded up napkin meant i'm finished but if the master got up from the table, folded his napkin, and laid it beside his plate, the servant would not dare touch the table because the folded napkin meant I'm coming back to finish the meal. Now, we don't, there's a, there's a lot of historians that really are not quite sure if this tradition actually exists. So this take on it is pre it's pretty interesting. It does give a hopeful message that Jesus, uh, that Jesus' message of the folded up napkin will come back. Uh, but that theme has also been running throughout different events. So, uh, again, that's debated as far as whether or not that actually happened. But it is interesting. Okay. Uh, let me give you my homily, and then we're going to get into our uh, revelations for the night. So, Jesus, the crucified one, has now been raised from the dead. He is risen. An utter defeat has been transformed into irreversible victory. Evil has had its way with God's anointed the Messiah. Uh, you know, it did all it could to break down the courage and fidelity of God's anointed Savior. It exhausted its arsenal of hate, injustice, humiliation, pain, torture. It fought an impressive, bloody fight. But God's anointed came out victorious. So what does that mean for us? What does it mean for you? It means everything. Absolutely everything. The resurrection is the Stamp that validates everything Jesus did and said. He, he said he was God's son to have authority to forgive sins, reestablish communion between God and us. His universal call to abandon self-centeredness for love of God and neighbor as the path of true righteousness and happiness. His promise to give grace through a church that will endure forever. Although there's many people in the Christian church who seemed to be a bit too busy on judging people. See, if Jesus had not been raised, none of that would have been worth listening to. He would have just been one more nice guy who finished last, one more dreamer whose dreams were squelched by the harsh reality of life. But this is why whenever people start living against Christ's teachings and example, they always raise doubts about the reality of the resurrection. After all, listen, here's the deal. If Christ did not ri rise from the dead, he has no more authority over our lives than Socrates, Confucius, Buddha, Muhammad, whoever. But he did rise from the dead. His victory over evil and falsehood and injustice and suffering is total, uh, irreversible. And in the face of 20 centuries, 21 centuries filled with a steady stream of saints, an unchecked growth of the church, and an unquenchable Christian vitality. No reasonable person can deny it. You know, so at, at people, as, as a Christians, we are Easter people, and Alleluia is sung. And these words of St. Augustine express the joy that comes with that this irreversible victory of Easter. This grace is not only joyful, but it is also transforming. It changes lives. Here are two true stories about lives that were transformed completely by Christ's resurrection. And let me tell you what they are. The first is about a working class man with almost no education. He tried to make something better out of his humble, poor life by going to work for a friend who was starting a new company. He, he was hoping for a new lease on life, but it didn't work out. In fact, his friend was arrested, thrown in prison, wrongly condemned for a crime he did not even commit. And in the end, this man, this innocent man, was brutally killed by a furious mob. The working class man was not only discouraged by this failure, but he was actually afraid that the same thing might happen to him. So he disowned his old friend, De dejected, went back to his former life. 
The second true story is about a woman of ill repute who had squandered her abundant gifts. She never got respect, never did anything to deserve any. A slave to her own sin, she cried herself to sleep at night. She simply couldn't imagine a better life than the one that she was living. Then she met someone who gave her hope. The same man from the first story who was starting a new business. She also went to work for him, trying to get a new lease on life. But then he was murdered. And her hope was extinguished like the fragile flame of a candle in the wind. So what happened next? Well, they found out that Jesus rose from the dead. And that made all the difference in their lives. For the woman's name is St. Mary Magdalene. And the man's name is St. Peter. You know, by, by putting our faith in Christ, our stories can become just like theirs. Today, we should relish this joy of Easter. Thanking God for letting us share in this victory, for giving us hope, not to listen to the, the, to the hater gators out there that try to discredit Jesus' divinity, because they're going to do it. They're going to do it. They're going to try to discredit Jesus at all costs. Don't listen to them. Don't, get, don't allow them to twist and manipulate because they are obviously being persuaded by something other than Christ. Stay away from listening to those people. I'm so just stay away. Remember, the devil is the father of all lies. And he will try everything that he can to make you doubt the resurrected Christ. But we look, we, we have to thank God and for letting us share in this victory, but we can't stop there. Let's let's not just enjoy it. Let's not just enjoy Easter. Let uh, we should let it change our lives. See, Christ's resurrection, it's not just a nice idea. It is the power of eternal life at work in us. So why not do something for the eight weeks of the Easter season to plug into that power? Almost every one of us, maybe some of us, made an effort to live Lent in a special way. And we talked about that in Bible study. Most likely, we some, some people maybe gave something up for Lent. Uh, maybe you started something new. And that was a practical way to give special graces that God sends during Lent some room to work in our souls. So if we gave something up as a way to, to help us live the you know, penitential season of Lent, why not take something up as a way to help us live the joyful season of Easter? See, in the second reason, in the second reading, St. Paul encouraged us to think of what is above, not of what is on earth. So why don't we make an Easter resolution uh, that will help us do that, that will help us keep in mind that uh, the eternal life in Christ that's awaiting for us because we're going to stay faithful to him. It could be something simple. Invite a family or friend member who has forgotten about Christ's victory to come to Bible study. Or like watching a classic movie together as a family, like uh, each Sunday from now to Pentecost, a joyful, uplifting movie. Or like having a special outing, uh, a get together with friends uh, sometime. Or perhaps maybe coming to come come to a uh, night prayer. We would love to have you. Maybe you can start that up. It's 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Monday through Friday. And all you got to do is just go to bishopjameslong.com, scroll all the way down to where it says night prayer, click it, and it takes you right there to Spreaker. It's free. Maybe you can do that. It's only 15 minutes. Or, or like taking some uh, time maybe each, uh, each evening to reread some of your favorite books. The ones that kind of stir up joy in your soul. I think if we ask the Holy Spirit to give us some ideas, I don't think he's going to be stingy. Just needs us to decide to let Easter make a difference in our lives the way it should. Our souls need that as much as they need the time of penance and contrition that we live during Lent. You know, I, I think the Christian church, and certainly Christianity, but the Christian church is a wise mother. The church is a wise mother. And giving us six weeks of Lent and eight weeks of Easter. So today we celebrate the risen Lord in our lives, in this world. So let's promise him that we're going to find a way to benefit from that wisdom and to share his love with everyone. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Well, yep, Christian Catholic, I, 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 we actually believe in transubstantiation, so definitely agree. Okay. 
Um, we are going into, let's see, Revelation, Revelation, there it is. All right, so we're going to start up on Revelation chapter 8, verse 10. All right, but we're going to talk about the third, uh, the third trumpet judgment. So uh, remember we talked about uh, the, the landmass directly opposite Israel is North and South America. And the ocean opposite of Israel is the Pacific Ocean. And remember, we talked about, not coincidentally, of course, uh, North and South America represent exactly 30% of the Earth's land mass. And the Pacific Ocean is exactly 30% of the world's oceans. So we talked about uh, how these trumpets are going to uh, cause the effect of the Earth. Now, I believe that, I truly believe that uh, Revelation is prophecy. There are some people that don't believe that. And I remember we've talked about that uh, many times about the four different interpretations that one can have regarding uh, Revelation. I personally believe it's prophecy. And so I, I do believe uh, in many things that the Re Revelation says. So other people don't. And that is that's fine. That is fine. But, you know, we're going to keep pushing on. Okay. Oh, yeah, let me open this up to because I said I would at uh, 9 p.m. So I'm going to open up chat for a little bit. And if you have any particular questions, you can uh, you can ask. And otherwise, we're going to move into Revelation chapter 8, verse 10. Okay. So we're going to see, hopefully, just, just be kind. Just be kind. Yeah, just be just be kind on TikTok. Just no no nastiness, and then because otherwise I'll have to turn subscriber channel on. And I don't want to do that. Okay, happy Easter to all of you. Revelation 8, chapter eight, verse ten and eleven. The third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers, and on the springs of waters, and the name of the star is called Wormwood, and a third of the waters became wormwood. And many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. All right. First of all, let me talk about this very quickly because I, I made a video of it um, uh, briefly about the uh, oh this, this the eclipse that everybody is freaking out about, and oh they're saying oh it's going to pass through eight Ninevehs and all this other stuff, folks. It it, it is such sensationalized. It is not. It's going to pass through two towns called Nineveh, one in, in Indiana and one in Ohio. So this whole idea, people, I'm telling you, this is what, the, it drives me crazy that people do this. But I, I promise you, I give you, more, matter of fact, I should do a live. I should do a live on TikTok during uh, the eclipse when it just simply moves on by, no trumpets, nothing happening. Uh, no rapture. And uh, but here's what they're going to do. I'm telling you what's going to happen. I'm, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. The people that's going on all over social media and spreading this this sensationalism to frighten you. Then now they're going to find something else. They'll find something else. I promise you. It'll be another event to scare you. And they'll and they'll throw out all these little all these things to try to convince you that they know for a fact that this is it. I just, it's it, it, it's appalling. Uh, they, and they won't, and the thing is, they never apologize. They never apologize. These people who go on social media to scare the hell out of everybody, they never apologize, not once. And they've been doing it for years. But they never come on and say, hey, I'm really sorry for spreading sensationalism that the world was going to end. I didn't mean to cause panic. They They don't ever do that. They don't ever do it. But what they do is then they find another event. Oh, I figured it all out. There's a comet coming and the comet's going to, it's like, shut up. Really stop. Enough of it. Enough. But they, they, they do it. Uh, they do it for the sole purpose and the only purpose to gain likes, sensationalism. And that's it. It drives me, drives me crazy. Drives me crazy. Um, it truly is. Drives me nuts. I don't speak Spanish. We speak English. Hi, Chad. Appreciate you being here. So anyway, uh, okay. Okay. The third trumpet blows, and it comes with the third and final judge, judgment against the earth. Uh, John says a great uh, burning star falls from heaven to the fresh waters on earth, turning them bitter. Yeah, fear, fear mongering is right. And this star has a name, Wormwood, which has no other meaning in Greek 
So by the context, we suppose it means bitter. And in trying to interpret uh, the type of star, uh, we have to work through some possibilities, okay? First, uh, it can't be a literal star since a burning sun can't fall upon the earth and certainly wouldn't only impact the fresh waters. So the earth would be totally consumed by any sun coming into contact with the earth. So it's a little space nerd stuff. Uh, and as we saw in the six sealed judgment in chapter six, this star could be a meteor since it falls from heaven and is burning. Okay. But a meteor wouldn't simply turn uh, waters bitter, nor would it be able to impact a third of the fresh water around the planet. So thirdly, the star has a name. It's not typical in scripture when describing inanimate objects like meteors. Uh, when a symbol is named in scripture, it usually indicates a personage, which brings up to the final type of star in scripture. It's a symbolic representation of an angel. Now, both in scripture, both in scripture, um, but in scripture, angels can have two kinds of names. So angels can have names that glorify God, like Gabriel or Michael. And angels can have uh, names that suggest corruption and a fallen nature, like Wormwood or other, or, well, Abaddon, I can say that because it's, it's, it's mentioned in Revelation. And so this is likely a fallen angel, a demon sent by God to do the bidding. And the demon's effect is to poison a third of the fresh waters on earth. So we have to, this is, it's, it's ugly in this revelation, but God does over and over and over and over to show you need to turn to Christ. Now, Revelation chapter 8, verse 12 says, The fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun and a third of the moon and a third of the stars were struck, so that a third of them would be darkened, and the day would not shine for a third of it, and the night in the same way. So the theme of the thirds continues with a third of the sun, moon, and stars being targeted in this judgment. But this can be a little confusing at first. What does it mean that a third of the sun and a moon and stars are darkened? Well, does it mean that a third of these bodies are taken away or that each body is reduced uh, in light output by a third? But John's description seems to indicate a third interpretation, which I believe. John says each body shines for one third less time. So the lights are out one third of the time they would normally shine. Um, you can fix things. Okay. Anyway, um, he says the day would not shine for one third of it. And the night would not shine for one third of it. So, so we can say that this means that the earth is receiving one third less energy from the sun and the stars. Um, I agree. I agree there, CC. So it really makes some sense there since the moon reflects the light of the sun. So while the sun turns off for one third of the day, it also turns off during one third of the day in the opposite side of the planet. That would result in the moon being off at the same time. So one third of the night and one third of the day would represent one third of a 24 hour day. Well, uh, I mean, and likewise, the stars ceasing to shine for a third of the night, probably time to coincide with the moon and the sun. So the effect is a total blackout for all the universe for a third of each 24 hour period. So besides the obvious fear factor, this change would lead to a dramatic a, you know, drop in temperature. It would be a, 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 a really ultimately a nuclear winter scenario. Crops would fail. Water sources would freeze. Livestock would pass away. Remember, for the, uh, remember, 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 you and me are in heaven. Yeah, I have already talked about this, so I'm not going to go again. So the end of the church age occurs first. Then you have what, what many people call the tribulation. Then you have what's called the second coming. You and me are in heaven. It's very clear. I've talked about this. I've given biblical references to explain why I believe this. Uh, and not only I, I mean, there's obviously many, many theologians believe this as well. So the, the end of the church age occurs before any of this. Occur we will see this from heaven. So the world has already seen a fourth of the population uh, pass away from war pestilence and starvation and then some unknown number of additional lives were lost when the north and south american continents were destroyed and then more passed when a third of the seas and the fresh waters failed so and now the heavens bring less heat 
and light of the earth, resulting even more loss of life. Some people actually call this uh, even there are some theologians say this could be a form of nuclear win uh, nuclear winter because of nuclear war uh, and causing uh, obviously a major problems with the atmosphere, with the sun not being able to penetrate down to the earth. And now the heavens bring less light to the uh, to and obviously heat to the earth, resulting even more loss of life. And those who do survive find life harder and harder. So the point is that as earth becomes increasingly inhospitable for human life, the world's population should think about what comes next. And meanwhile, the Antichrist continues conquering even as he would uh, as, as the world he, de he desired becomes increasingly undesirable. Well, some people are. And 144,000 continue to bring the gospel to a lost and uh, ever more dying world ready to escape the judgments. So finally, the, tr uh, the trumpet judgments are suspended for a brief time to allow for another warning to the earth. Uh, Revelation chapter 8, verse 13, Then I looked, and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Okay. And again, people are asking me on, on Messenger, well, it, you know, you're not teaching other uh, interpretations. I Well, obviously you weren't with me from the very beginning because I've been teaching this now for how many weeks? And uh, for several, almost over a month actually now, going in two months. And I've made it very clear. I've already taught about the four different interpretations, and I believe this is prophecy. So that is my right to believe as a theologian that this book is prophetic. And you know, if you don't want to believe it, that's fine. You don't have to, but I do. So uh, this particular verse, an eagle flies in midheaven, John says, and the mid and, and the term midheaven, it requires, I think, some explanation. Thank you very much. So the Jewish people did not have distinct Hebrew words for these different places. The sky, outer space, the throne room of God were, were called by the same Hebrew word meaning heavens. So to distinguish between the, these uh, three heavens, the Jews numbered them counting from the earth and moving upward. So the first heaven is the place where birds fly. The second or mid heaven is the place of the planets and stars. And the third heaven is the place where God dwells. This is why people talk about the firmament. In this case, uh, John says there was an eagle flying in mid heaven which refers to outer space, outside our atmosphere. So obviously we know that, that literal eagles cannot live in outer space. And furthermore, this eagle speaks in a loud voice to announce the whole world that more judgments are coming. So the term eagle refers to uh, an angel. And John calls it an eagle probably because it moves back and forth, circling its warning. So the eagle's warning declares that the three final trumpets are coming and they will be woe, woe, woe to the earth. And as I mentioned earlier, these judgments will be directed at the physical bodies of people instead of against uh, the physical earth itself. Thank you, everybody. Now, remember, and the term uh, woe suggests it will be most terrible, period. It will be so bad that even death is an escape for those suffering. And the structure of those woe judgments is another of the the, remember the rushing nesting dolls that I talked about? Example that I gave uh, several weeks early. So just as the seventh seal judgment is all the trumpet judgment, so it goes here again. The, seven, the seventh judgment trumpet is the seven bowl judgments. So the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet uh, judgments are the woe judgments. And the first two, obviously, are the last two judgments. A trumpet judgments and the third uh, woe judgments are all the bow judgments poured out so here, here let's go into let's go into the, the the first woe judgment revelation chapter 9 verse 1 then the fifth angel sounded and i saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him he opened the bottomless pit and smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given to them, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not permitted to kill anyone. 
but to torment for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die and death flees from them. Wow. Thank you for that. I appreciate that, the book. Well, this is a pretty tough stuff here. The, this woe judgment begins as the first four did with a trumpet sounding. And so a fifth warning now unfolds and a star falls to earth. So the context here makes it easy uh, to see that the star here is another fallen angel, not a meteor or a burning sun. So later in verse, uh, verse one, John describes this fallen star as him. And the actions of this star makes it clear it is a person uh, or a being, not an object. So once again, the term star refers to an angel. And an angel that falls to the earth is a particular, it's, it's a picture of a demon, a sinful fallen angel. And later in verse 11, we get the name of this demon, Abaddon. Um, now, this it mean, also means uh, de uh, destroyer in Greek, which is why John gives us that clarification so we can know what Abaddon, Abaddon means. Uh, so remember, as I mentioned, a negative name like this would confirm. This is a fallen angel or demon and uh, caused tremendous pain and suffering. And the demon is given the key to the bottomless pit, as John says. And that means he has permission to set those in the pit free. So the pit is described as bottomless and is accessed through the earth, since that is where the angel lands. Uh, and literally, the, the Greek word for bottomless, it, it kind of it means abyss. And all these terms refer to the same place below the earth, a place that the Bible says is a prison for disobedient spirits. The most common term in the Old, Old Testament uh, in this place is called Sheol, or the pit. Remember, jo Job chapter 33, verse 28 says, He has redeemed my soul from going to the pit, and my life shall see the light. So according to, to Luke chapter 16, Sheol is, is really two places, one for the souls of unbelievers and one for the souls of Old Testament uh, saints. Before Jesus, God held everyone who died there, saints in comfort and unbelievers in torment. And after the Lord's resurrection, the souls of believers were removed and accompanied G in, uh, Jesus into heaven. But the souls of unbelievers remain and still there today, many people believe, in a place called Hades or otherwise known as the pit. In the, but in the New Testament, it tells us that in this place is a special corner or, or a prison, if you will, where the souls of disobedient angels are held, demons. So they are who are particularly evil and are cast into this place to be confined for a time. Remember, even Peter said this. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them into pits of darkness reserved for judgment... And did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And Jesus asked him in Luke chapter 8, verse 30, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they were importing, they were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. So the abyss or the pit not only holds the souls of the departed unbelievers, but also the spirits of rebellious angels. Not all demons live in the abyss. Most still roam free. But some were so terrible that God confined them to limit their rampage. So now has come time for the Lord to permit these worse of the fallen demons to escape their temporary confinement. Why? Because if you want to keep denying Jesus Christ as your per personal Lord and Savior, then you'll be spending eternity with these very demons. That is as cold as you can possibly. I mean, that is as blunt as you can possibly get. Uh, I, I do believe. Uh, I I do believe that hell exists. And uh, Jesus said it. Jesus hell, said hell exists. Uh, my prayer is that no one is there. I don't want anyone to be there. So the chief demon, uh, it says, uh, I'm not. I'm not here to change your mind. Jesus said that they exist, and I'm not. If, I'm not going to change anybody's mind. Nope, not here to do that. I'm not here to prove to you that demons exist. I'm here to help the families who know they do, 
So I see, that's the thing. I, I, I don't get into this narcissistic uh, argument. Well, you better prove to me. I don't have to prove to you anything. Jesus Christ, the son of God, the, the, the Messiah said that they exist. So <laughs> I'm not here to prove to you anything. Um, okay. Roland, I, I didn't, I don't know why you're mentioning this, Roland, because we're not talking about that. Anyway, the chief demon is given permission to let them loose, and it would seem that the destroyer may be none other than Satan himself. So that's that's the thing, folks. Uh, either demons exist or they don't. And there's a lot of people who say, no, demons don't exist. Demons don't exist. Then I would not be wasting my time if demons did not exist. People, you, one thing you cannot ever do, you can't ever, you cannot, no one can ever question my intent. And that's why I have never charged. And that's why I never will charge. That's why I never receive a payment or a stipend or salary from the church. Everything that I do, well, I don't care. You, 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 you okay. Uh, everything that I do, I do for free. Um, I'm going to tell you this and make it very clear to you. If demons do not exist, I'd be doing something else with my time. Because I don't charge. See, if I charge five or ten thousand dollars to perform an exorcism, then you could say, "Aha, that's why you're doing it," and that would be a that would be a fair argument. But I don't charge. I go to people's homes and I pay out of my own pocket. Until recently, I've I've just recently started asking for help because I couldn't do it anymore. I've been doing it for twenty years, and I can't keep going to, uh, I mean, every place, every place. I couldn't do it. And nor should I be expected to. So I don't charge, never have. And I can tell you, uh, I have a doctorate and three master degrees, and I do this for free. And I promise you, I would not waste my time if they didn't exist. I do something else. So, um, and again, I'm not here to prove that demons exist. I'm here to help the families who know they do. So the chief demon, as I mentioned, is given permission to let them loose. He's the master of the demons. And according to Matthew chapter 25, we're talking about Satan. And the fact that this fallen angel is called the destroyer adds weight to that interpretation. So God gives this demon, whoever he is, a key to open the pit so that the demons inside can be let loose. They come out of the pit raging, having been confined there for thousands of years, and they are undoubtedly eager to wreak havoc on the earth. As the pit is opened, Smoke of this place rises to block the sunlight. That, that Bible, this confirms the Bible's co constant testimony that hell and the abyss, many people believe that it, it, it exists below our feet. Now, you can say, I disagree with that. I'm, I'm not saying it does or doesn't. But it's a, a, many people argue that. So could lava, could the lava that erupts from the earth from time to time be connected with the activities of hell in some way? That's even some people argue this. I don't know. This is, I necessarily agree with that. So, but once the pit is opened, John describes what he sees coming out of this place. He, he sees uh, like locusts descend upon the earth that have power uh, like that of a scorpion given to them. Presumably the giver of that power. I mean, obviously they have, God gives all power to everything. And but th there was instruction. They cannot hurt the vegetation of the earth, but only certain men. And that is the opposite of normal locusts, since a true locust insect only harms vegetation. They cannot take the life of anyone, only torment them from a time. And there are a group of men that cannot be hurt by this judgment at all. Scripture says God will not appoint his children to wrath, and he distinguishes between the godly and ungodly. In his judgments. Remember in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. The, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Well, thank you. So the men who have the seal of God are excluded from that attack. So this refers to the 144,000 that we talked about. And uh, it, it has to apply to those who come to faith also as a result of the new evangelist. Remember, the end of the church age occurred, so Christians are gone. So there's the only people that are left are, un, are people who are unbelievers. So we know that there's a conversion that is working. And they will not suffer this, uh, this judgment, but since this is the first time we've seen an exception, we've got to apply it very carefully. 
So this exception applies specifically to the attacks on the physical body of a person. So it's logical to assume that the prior judgments against the physical earth did impact everybody. But now the judgments are specifically targeting people in particular terrible ways. So that the Lord is making a distinction there. The Lord has done this in the past when judging the world supernaturally. Remember when Noah, he saved, when he, we know that when um, he saved Noah and his family before the flood and he saved Lot and his family before the brimstone in Sodom. And in the case of Israel, the Lord preserved the godly within. And John describes the torment these demons will inflict. It, it's difficult to comprehend. Uh, see, unlike prior judgments, these demons are not permitted to harm the earth at all because now the target will be the body of every person. So the demons will inflict painful stings for a total of five months. Now, John says this torment will be like that of, will like that of a scorpion sting, and scorpion stings are notoriously painful. And some of the toxins in scorpion venom are so toxic they're used for chemotherapy to kill cancer cells. And this discomfort of this torment is magnified many times by its duration. So the stinging lasts for five months. It's not clear if a, 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 a single sting lasts for that time, but we just simply don't know. So imagine living for five months with scorpions continuously crawling under your clothing, stinging you. Well, uh, it's impossible to imagine the physical and psychological effects of enduring that for five months. And we know that it lasts for five months, but I suspect those who suffer this penalty will know how long it lasts while they endure it. Um, and they would have to read and believe scripture to know the length. So as we contemplate such a fate of endless stinging, we can see how it might lead a person to contemplate, you know, the unaliving themselves. An otherwise sane person will be willing to uh, unalive themselves rather than face another day of the pain. And the Lord anticipated that desire, so the judgment has been has a twist to it. The option to pass away by any means is removed by God during these five months. So John says. John, verse, uh, John says in verse 6, men will eventually seek to end their lives rather than suffer through this judgment, but God will supernaturally prevent it. It is, it's kind of intriguing to consider how God might accomplish that. Will he make people uh, immortal? Like, you can't do it. Well, what if a person throws himself in a fire or blows himself? We don't know. How will they survive? I, I think there's a lot of theologians that say that they are uh, incapacitated to a degree that they simply cannot carry out such plans. They're simply writhing in pain all day, all the time, without relief, without the strength to do anything to harm themselves. And John says that they will long to pass away. And the literal Greek word for long means to crave or desire. I mean, how much suffering does a person face before they crave death? So we're going to come back to that question. And on Wednesday, we're going to talk about uh, these, uh, John describes these creatures. And that's in Revelation chapter 9, verse 7. But we're doing that on Wednesday. That way I can get to some questions before we wrap things up. So for those of you on Spreaker, I'm going to say goodnight to you guys. I'm not leaving everybody. I'm just uh, closing out Spreaker. That way I'll have one less program to open so I can answer some questions because to the best of my ability. Okay. So anyway, uh, I, like I said, uh, many, 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 many times, uh, I do believe that uh, I do believe in Revelation. And yep, I absolutely believe it is prophecy. That's what I believe. And I have the right to believe that. And other people have a right to disagree. And that's okay, too. That's okay. Oh, well, thank you, Judy. That's beautiful. I've never seen that before, actually. Thank you. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, the, 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 the bold judgments are quite interesting. Uh, well, thank you. Um, the bowl judgment, the first bowl is painful sores. The second bowl turns the sea into blood. The third bowl turns rivers and springs and water into blood. The fourth bowl, uh, the sun burns people with fire. Uh, the fifth bowl is plunges kingdom uh, of uh, the beast into darkness. The sixth bowl, it dries up the Euphrates, Armageddon. So folks, all this, all this talk about the Euphrates is drying up, <laughs> you, that's the sixth bowl. If you're going to follow Revelation, that's the sixth bow. And then seventh bow is judgment against Babylon. So 
I don't know why people keep talking about, oh, it's blow, it's drying up, it's drying up. Okay, all right, okay, okay, okay. It's, it drives me crazy. But again, it's just something that people try to scare people with, and it's like, oh, no, no, no. All right, so if you have any questions, I'll do the best I can to answer them. Um, and otherwise, we'll... Well, I, do, I believe, I, I think there's a lot of bad things going on in Hollywood. We're certainly seeing that now, aren't we? We're seeing, we are seeing the, the truth of Hollywood being presented. Uh, it is, it, you know, there's a, there's a lot of corruption there. There's a lot of corruption and we're seeing this and I think we're going to see it a lot more. Let me tell you something. I think there's going to be a tremendous, I, I think you're going to be very shocked with what is going to be presented uh, this year regarding uh, Hollywood. I think the veil is going to be lifted and we are going to see just how perverted many people uh, who are in uh, the entertainment field are. Uh, it is it is unbelievably perverted. And I, I think we're going to, I think we will see this and I think we will see it. And I think many people are going to be quite shocked uh, when they find out who participated in, in um, the, the, these activities. Well, a veil, meaning it, it, it is a, um, it's a metaphor, if you will. It's like a curtain being pulled back. You know, when we think of Hollywood, we think of stars and glitz and glamour. But I think um, that, that uh, the curtain is going to be pulled back and you're, we're going to see what goes on behind the scenes. And uh, I think it's going to be exposed uh, for a lot of un disturbing behavior. So just buckle your seatbelts because I think this year is going to get pretty nasty with that. So, and I think you're going to be quite surprised. Yeah. Yeah, you remember, I am absolutely convinced that will happen. I'm absolutely convinced we are going to see some unbelievable explosion, explosive um, revelations. Oh, I agree. I agree, Jenny. Yeah, I agree. The, 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 no question that uh, the devil you know, certainly attacked and uh, intervene uh, into the church especially what what happened with all the uh, the abuse and um, I think every person regardless I, I, I if, if you're the clergy if you're the priest that that perpetrated the crime uh, the bishop if you are a cardinal I don't care who you are if you covered that up you will have a very rough day when you talk to God uh, do you believe an idea when God God is already one God is already one. So and God is already one. We we have the victory already through the cruci the, through the cross. And the cross and the resurrection. So we, I don't think you have to worry about that. This is why I I you don't have to worry about that. Okay. That's right. It is finished. All right. Uh if you have any questions guys you can uh, let's see. A needle in the haystack. It's just, it's just a meaning. It's difficult to find a needle in the haystack. Yeah, I'm telling you, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, you know, this uh, prosperity gospel is demonic, pure demonic. There's nothing, there's nothing Christian about prosperity gospel. I've, I am very outspoken, very outspoken against that uh, because, um, Prosperity gospel is just pure evil, pure evil. Good, Chris. Good. Well, because, I, you know, Julie, Julie's asking, how do you stay positive with so much evil and terror around us? Because I know that the end, the devil loses. See, we, we already have uh, we have this. We have the story. So we, we know that we know the end of the movie. So in the end, uh, we are. This look, this is what I do. I, I don't worry about the all the people trying to go online scaring people about the end of the times and, and all this other stuff. They only they're only doing it to make a buck. That's it. They're doing it to get likes, they're doing it to get subscribers, 
They're doing it to scare the hell out of you so they can make a buck off your off your off being off terrifying you. That's and I think that quite honestly is sadistic. I think that's very sadistic. Uh, I I don't understand why anybody would do that to another person. I just don't. That that that's very troubling to me. But that's the bottom line. That is the bottom line. That's why people do it because they know they're going to scare you. They know that you're going to tune in. And then they know for a fact they're going to get likes and subscribers. That That's the way it goes. Um, even that one, I was talking about that just the other day, that, that one pastor that was predicting he knew exactly when the end of the world was going to happen. And he said it, and it, he, he knew for a fact he did all this formula, and people went on social media, oh my gosh, the world's going to end, this pastor did this, and they were doing the, And then he had the audacity to tell you that to also buy his books. And he was selling his books the day the event was supposed to happen, the day the rapture was supposed to happen, that he claims was going to happen. He was selling his books. So it's like, dude, if I buy your books, I'm not going to get it. But he sold he sold the books like crazy. See, it's just it, it's all a, it's all a con game. Uh, it's, it's, it's just, it, it is. It's greed. It's greed. I, I believe that Revelation is a prophecy. I believe it will happen. Uh, I do believe in tribulation. I believe in the second coming of Christ, absolutely. But I am not going to sit here and scare people because you don't need to be frightened of it. Well, see, Kat, uh, we talked about that. I, uh, in, in Revelation, I explained rapture, where it comes from, the, the root word, and why Protestants use that word. It does. Scripture says that the end of the church age will be caught up. And so that really is how we, that's how people will refer to that as, as rapture, but uh, really, honestly, how that happens, we just simply don't know. But it's clear in Scripture that the end of the church age occurs first. Now that I do believe, uh, and then of course, when that is done, then you then you have the tribulation. So that is what I believe. But uh, again, I understand there are some theologians who don't, and they have the right to believe that, just as I have the right to believe that it is prophecy. Well, Tori, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of dis disagreements with the, the councils, church councils, and with quite a few, actually. Even Luther had issues. And, and, and Luther had major issues with, uh, with the, fine, the, the abuse within the church. And he was right. Uh, I mean, there were many things that he was absolutely 100% right about. There was a tremendous amount of abuse. Uh, and so I, I think he was right on, right on target with that. I mean, indulgences, really? I mean, that, that to me, that, that was absolutely, that there's, you can never, you can never, no matter what anybody says, you're never going to convince me that selling indulgences was, was, was Christian. Indulgences, and this is one of the things that Luther hated. And he was right about that. Indulgences was like, oh, bless me, Father, for I'm about to sin. I'm going to commit adultery. And then the pastor would say, okay, well, you know, uh, donate $25 and I'll give you this indulgence. What in the world is that? And But that's what happened. And so, the, the, but the church made a tremendous amount of money on, on indulgences. As a matter of fact, the Sistine Chapel, that, that's one of the reasons why the Sistine Chapel, the, the finance was it, was, it was financed so well because of selling indulgences. That's truly, prob tr truly problematic. IHS is, uh, is uh, representing the name of Christ. It's derived from the uh, Greek, um, uh, a Greek spelling name. Of, so that's it's often used in Christian art and symbolism. So it's, uh, it, they're typically displayed in Latin script uh, as, or, like, or as a monogram in various religious contexts. The Book of Enoch has problems uh, with it. I mean, I think it's important to read it. Uh, I think theologians should read it. But the, the, the problem with the Book of Enoch well, there's several things. Number one, Nephilim. Uh, Nephilim means fierce warriors in Greek. It has nothing to do with giants, nothing to do. And no, the, the angels, the fallen angels did not have relations with women. The sons of God, I've talked about this before. The sons of God were known as the children of Seth. They were not fallen angels. Jesus says that uh, uh, angels neither marry or procreate. So the idea that, uh, that these angels procreated with women, it's just absurd. It's just incorrect. They did not have, and also Genesis chapter six, verse four tells us that the Nephilim existed before and after the sons of God had relations with women. 
So therefore, the Nephilim couldn't have not have been the offspring of, of demons and women. And even 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse, uh, verse 7, Paul tells us, stop arguing over endless genealogies and the foolish myths of the Nephilim. So even Paul was aware of this uh, because that's what it does. Uh, the, the book of Enoch has this long genealogy going all the way back to Satan. And also it puts the blame of sin right square, right there on, on the shoulders of demons. And it takes the accountability away from the human person. And that's incorrect. Uh, demons certainly will tempt you to sin, but ultimately it's our free will. And that's what that, so that's why the, a lot of there was some errors with the book of Enoch. And the, again, the Nephilim were considered Greek, uh, Greek um, fierce warriors. They were not the uh, offspring of demons and women. So. Uh, well, there are several, actually, uh, Diane. Okay. And so and keep in mind, I have a lot of, I have questions over here. I have questions over here so I can do, uh, there are extra books. Oh, there are extra books in the Catholic Bible versus the Protestant Bible. Um, so if you, if you, if you have a Protestant Bible and it says with Apocrypha, so what the, okay. The, the, they're, they're, they're known as deuterocanonical books. And they're Tobit, Judith, Wisdom, Sirach, uh, Ecclesiasticus, Baruch, uh, First and Second Maccabees. So, and uh, there's also Esther and Daniel. So, no, Tori, I do not. I, I think that uh, the I, I'm not big into the um, into that argument. Yeah, but just because, I mean, you're, you're talking about a calendar year, that, that that doesn't reduce the fact that Jesus is the Passover lamb, just because the United States happens to... <laughs> we, we have this tendency to believe that the world revolves around the United States, and it doesn't. Uh, so I, I, I'm, not, um, I'm not too... I'm not too sure as why we think that. Why? Because in our calendar year, uh, the, the Easter falls on this day versus that day, and now all of a sudden that reduces Jesus actually, actually being the Paschal lamb. I, I don't think God is going to say, oh, boy, that's a problem. You know, it's, I, I just don't fall into that. Okay. Yeah, if you would do me a favor and instead of um, sending me on Messenger, just, it, it's kind of better if you put it in, in the chat. That way it's easier. That way I don't have three different things, you know, kind of. Um, Protestants follow, they, the Protestants follow the, the, uh, the Bible as a sole authority, obviously, of faith and practice. And they, um, they believe that the canonical books of the Bible should be limited to those originally written in Hebrew or Greek. So the deuterocanonical books, also known as the Apocrypha, as I mentioned, they're a group of books that are found in the Septuagint. And that's the Greek translation of the Old Testament, but they're not in the Hebrew Bible. So Protestants consider those books to be useful, like for historical and cultural uh, understanding, but they don't uh, uh, argue that they are view them as inspired. So they're inspired scripture. I certainly believe in the Trinity. Yes, yeah, Sammy, absolutely. Spiritual beliefs and Christian beliefs. You'll have to explain that to me. I, I when you say spiritual beliefs and Christian beliefs, what well, it is a sin if you have spiritual beliefs and Christian beliefs. You have to explain that one to me. Um, oh, you can find those in the Catholic. You can actually find them online. You can go to the Blue Letter Bible app, Ruth. You can go there and uh, absolutely, Julie. So yeah, you can go to the uh, Blue Letter Bible app. And uh, they're there. They're, the, the, the Apocrypha is listed there as well. Well, do we know God's DNA? It's interesting because the Shroud of Turin has uh, blood on it, which I believe the Shroud of Turin is legitimate. I do believe it is the, the burial cloth of Christ, and it was AB positive. So that's pretty interesting. 
a matter of fact, I just did a presentation on that uh, Friday. Yeah, the Shroud of Torrent is quite interesting. Oh, you're AB positive? No, well, thank you there, Mountain Woman. From my understanding, uh, someone told me that AB positive was universal. I don't know anything about, you know, you know, blood donor and, or, or what's positive. Uh, but apparently AB positive is anybody, no matter what your blood type, can receive AB positive uh, blood transfusion. You'll have to. That's what someone told me. I, I didn't know. Oh, negative is a universal donor. Well, see now, you see U.S. Navy correct said so that's correct. So, see what I'm saying? It's I don't know, uh, Michelle. You're in the medical field. Is AB positive the universal blood type that you can donate to anybody? Because everybody was saying when I did it, see O is universal. Everyone's saying is O is O positive is universal. And money for that new jet. Oh, I wish I had uh, a new jet. I wish I had a jet. I wish. I wish I had a new car. Forget the jet. My car is 20, 19 years old, 2018 years old. Oh, negative. Oh, that's the one that's very rare. Okay. See, I don't know. I have no idea. But anyway, that's what it is. That's what it is. So.